Hello! Welcome to the second episode of The Litmus Test, the show for the creative community. I am Phil Moore, and today we're going to talk about education and training in the arts. But before we start that, I want to get the words to this right, I would like to acknowledge the dark and young people who are the traditional custodians of this land, and I also pay respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any other Aboriginals present. Now, today we've got an exciting panel lined up, but before we get into it, we're going to kick off with a song from Novocaine. So welcome, please, Novocaine. Missing you. I'm so blue tonight. I'm missing you tonight. 
Thank you, Nova Kane. And they will be back at the end of the show to do another song for us. And if you're watching our live stream, you'll get to see a whole set from them. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, but right now, we're going to do the news with Peter Healy. Hi. Expressions of interest, if you're a visual artist or a sculptor or somebody of that ilk, expressions of interest are open now for the creation of a new iconic artwork at the Gosford Regional Gallery. They've just had $20,000 of funding injected from the Gosford Foundation Trust. Council's asking the community in general for design concepts, philanthropy based. But you'd better be quick. It's, I think, finishing next week. In fact, Friday the 29th of May, expressions of interest close. Phil. In fact, by the time you watch this, it might yeah. be just a day or two away. <laughs> Getting quick. Um, also local news, um, Jim Dyers, who does these consultancies and these lectures about um, place making, which is how to make your place a better place. So he's, gonna, he's coming to Gosford to do a talk at the Laycock Street Community Theatre on Wednesday the 3rd of June. If you're interested in being part of a discussion about how to make Gosford a better, more livable place, especially from our point of view in terms of making arts more centric in Gosford area. Go along. It's at um, 5.30 p.m. on the 3rd of June, but you need to email Cathy Forbes at Gosford Council to um, book a place. That's a pretty big yeah. question, how to make Gosford a more livable place. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to try and answer it, Jim is. Um, politically, Arts Minister George Brandis has been in the news recently. He's managed to pinch a whole bunch of money from the independent federal arts funding body, the Australia Council, to establish his own national program for the excellence in arts. He got $104.7 million to be precise, that's over four years and approximately 16% of the total funding to establish his own program. Um, little detail available though as to how the program will operate and no indication whatsoever as to whether it'll be a peer-based review or whether there'll be any mechanism for a review at all. So well, what is basically done is taken 104.8 million away from the Arts Council over the next four years and he's going to put it into a discretionary arts, you know, discretionary fund under his discretion. And so according to Arts Hub here, he has ripped it out of the Australia Council's budget. Um, the funding cuts total 29 million in the coming year 16% of their total budget um, is creating the National Centre for Excellence in the Arts, uh, which will allow, in his words, for a truly national approach to arts funding and will deliver on a number of government priorities, including national access to high quality arts and cultural experience. Well, of course, you would say that. Uh, the budget also removes 5.2 million in funding from the Australia Council. Ba basically, he's taking a chunk out to put into to his own particular fund. Which may or may not be a good thing. I guess time will, um, time will show. Well, the argument is that the, 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 the big theatre companies, the Opera House, all the, 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 their funding is safe. Most of this money is going to come from the smaller people, the smaller grants that we get through the, the Australia Council. And he's going to be giving it, the argument is, to pet projects of his, you know, of... Um, Elton John Turing or something. And stuff that has, has a more commercial value. He's looking for stuff that has partnerships with commercial partners, which the Arts Council has always been against. The Australia Council has always been against because, you know, there's a conflict of interest potential there. Anyway, this is a topic I think we're going to discuss more in our panel a little later mm. on. Yeah? Uh, Screen Australia's funding was cut too by 3.7 million. And oh, no! A few other people lost <laughs> out. That affects Phil directly. Um, and some of this might come up for discussion at the Arts Hub 2015 conference, which comes up, I think, at the end of next month, or the 26th of June, yes. Mm. 26th of June. I have some local news. The uh, regional support group, the re regional youth support group in Gosford, have established something called the Sound Lab, and that's running a new music program for 9 to 15 year olds at the Youth Arts Warehouse in Gosford. Um, exhibitions, Tookley and District Art Society have their 70th art exhibition coming up soon. Venue is the Federation Gallery at Wallera Point. Um, Central Coast Art Society have a paint out somewhere in nature each week and basically you turn up with your artist tools, your paintbrush or your pencil or whatever you use, meet at a pre-arranged location and have some artistic and social inspiration. Uh, drama, Wyong Drama Group have a series of plays coming up by internationally acclaimed author Peter Kokan that's running shortly. And in music, plenty of live music on offer around the region, although most of it relating to covers bands and uh, the recently fashionable, among venue owners at least, 
open mic nights. Uh, this they have an open mic here, which is very successful apparently. Well, they do, and some of them are really good, but the concept basically can be a bit sort of dubious because it's popular with the venue owners because they don't have to pay the performers apart from whoever's running the show and providing the equipment. So it becomes a cheap entertainment for the venue owner, so I, that could be a good thing for them. It's also on a positive, it's a great thing for somebody inexperienced who wants to get some experience in front of a crowd rather than just karaoke. It gives everyone a chance to get up yeah, and do it properly. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, can, they can have a go. Uh, two good examples of the concept locally are Bill Chambers' Songwriters Night at Quattro and also Michael Moko's Tuesday Jam at the Evoca Beach Hotel. The quality of those is rather high and uh, they're, they're good examples but uh, great if you want some experience mm. other than that you've got to suck it and see really one night it could be fantastic at one of these things and the next night it's you're thinking why did i even come <laughs> out <laughs> well I, they actually as i said they have them here at the hut i haven't actually had a chance to come to any when do you have them lou when do you have the Second, Second Sunday, Sunday of every month they have a, an open mic night and here. And I so know that one, Brent yeah. Murphy's taken that on here and he's, they're doing a uh, little competition thing over a period of <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Voice from the crowd who knows more about it than me, right. um, uh, which is nothing. I don't know anything much about it other than it's probably a good idea because they're getting a best of and then they have a final concert and, and, and it'll be the right, best So if that's your thing, look and seek out your open mics. Just mm. finally, um, Keith Wellen, you might remember the Grant guy, was on our show last month. Well, he's actually going to be running a workshop um, at the RDA, Regional Development of Australia, at uh, Arimba campus up that way on Tuesday the 16th of June. Uh, at six o'clock. So check out his website, The Grand Sky, if you want to find out more about that workshop that he's doing. Okay, that's it for the news. Um, tonight's episode is about arts and education, uh, uh, training and education in the arts. So to kick that off, we've got a package we're going to show you uh, with the opinions of a few people, one of whom is our guest panellist tonight. So let's run that package now. <laughs> This month on the litmus test, out and about, we're talking to a number of people who are key practitioners in their own educational field in the arts on the coast. Let's hear what they have to say. The fastest growing sector of the economy is what could be called the creative industries. And that's everything through from art to design to architecture to software to digital, all of that. Um, down in Sydney, in the, east, in the eastern half of Sydney, not just the eastern suburbs, but the eastern half of Sydney, about 10 or 11% of people are employed in those so-called creative industries. Up okay. here, it is 1.9%. We've got to build those creative industries because they're the future. What I see on the coast compared to, say, Sydney, and this is a demo, it's a partly a demographic thing as well, like most people who finish school who have interest in the arts or want to travel or they want something more in life, something more interesting, they leave the coast immediately. They're gone. So they've got this big void of like, you know, 19 to 35, they're all gone. And that's generally, you know, a really creative artistic period and they go and do that somewhere else. The importance of music and the arts, you know, when, when you've got people that are drawn to it, that are born to do it, uh, if you turn them away from it, if there, if there aren't opportunities for those, for people to develop those skills, um, you know, it's, it's that, that becomes the wasteland, the wasted youth, you know, what, what, what else is there? But if you support the youth when they, they want to play guitar or they want to take pictures or make movies and you support, you support young people with those ventures, then you, you're creating a life skill, a life journey. The key driver of our programs I see now and also into the future is the schools. And uh, I think it's, uh, I think we've got a, a very excellent opportunity to build upon our already quite extensive program. Uh, I think music in schools, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Some see um, university education um, as uh, a direct route to a vocational um, destination, I guess. And uh, I think it's a real shame because uh, for me, um, we're, we're about sort of I guess emboldening people with uh, more translatable or transferable skills, a, a broader sense of an education, which uh, I think in some ways is uh, sadly um, uh, vanishing in the uh, contemporary vocationally orientated okay. university sector. Um, the Central Coast has always been what I believe quite sporting orientated. Um, so for us to be able to access um, the, the arts for our children at a young age, I think is really valid. Um, 
and we have found that we've always had strong supporters um, because not everybody fits into that mould of being the sporty rugby type or the runner, um, but they all have a need for gaining life skills. Um, they all have a need for encouraging an inquiring mind. They all have a need for being able to be articulate as they grow older. I'd, es I'd estimate that out of the 5,000 kids who graduate from the HSC, who leave school every year, there's possibly about 250 who would be interested in a career in the arts. So there's potential interest there, but there just aren't the job opportunities up here. I think the perception here is perhaps, um, I think there's value uh, perceived by music education or through music education but I'm not sure that it's on the same level as what it might be in other parts of Sydney for example such as the northern beaches. I've learned everything through trial and error you know if I could box that up and give it to a kid in three or four years um, that's that's what we what we aim to achieve here. So for us it's about increasing their confidence and self-esteem um, broadening their verbal communication skills and giving them that boost of creativity, a place where they can, I guess, share their ideas and their imagination. When you look at arts training, music is what I know about mostly, it's very kid focused. And like, it's all about getting the kids in to, and I think it's something, I mean, everyone will support the idea of teaching kids and exposing kids to these things. <coughs> But also it becomes about getting the dollars because there are kids all the time, you know. And like I've given up on kids here because really it's the parents that want to go. And that's the truth of it. All these parents bring their kids. The kids are bored. Drumming's hard. Drumming's not for like, just for whacking. Like that's a part of it, but that's not a class. That's babysitting. The more opportunities that we have to create liminal spaces, spaces that are between um, the uh, academy and, um, and the uh, community, between um, the experience of being a student and the experience of professional artists, is uh, I think uh, they're the kinds of spaces in which we can produce um, not only new, new, new skills and understandings, but also the, the beginnings of new networks. What do you see in another 10 years' time? Is, yeah, look, are we moving forward? On to, be, to be honest, I actually think our, our children have changed considerably over that time. Okay. Um, and I think that's obviously very much the, the pace of life that things are very fast, the technology races sort of on them. Um, and I, I guess personally I see an even greater need for the creative arts to be out there. We need more investment in arts training on the Central Coast because the Central Coast needs creative industries. It's an absolute economic priority for the area. And if we don't have local people trained in creative skills, pursuits and so on, then we won't have that nucleus of people who can begin to grow what's a very tiny creative industry segment. Fiona Donaldson, who is a dancer and choreographer and director of the dance school, Fiona's Studio of Dance. Hello, Fiona. Hello. Next to you, we have Ian Maguire, actor and founder of the Mad Cow Theatre Company, which runs drama classes for kids of all ages. Hi, Ian. Hi. Over this side, we have Patrick Brennan, who is a bassoonist and conductor and the current artistic director for the Central Coast Conservatorium. Good evening. Hello, Patrick. And on the far end there, we have Julie Jewell, who is an art teacher and children's book author. Hello, Julie. Hello. So, the topic today is training and education in the arts. But before we get to that, do any of you have an opinion about this um, funding cut to the Arts Council, the Australia Council? Let me start with you, Ian. Look, whenever you take money from somewhere, and I think I heard you uh, voice this before, it, it's been ripped out. I think was the word. That's um, the Arts Hub's opinion, yes. Yeah, so, so, well, the Arts Hub opinion. So, um, I think there's a lot of validity in that because once you uh, water something down, it, it's... You take cordial, for example, and, and you add more liquid and take more cordial out, it's just a weaker substance. So, are we trying to, support, are we trying to spread ourselves too thin in the arts? That's what I'm saying. We don't have a large... Uh, amount of people in Australia, so dollars per capita are very important. America, China, 260 million people, a billion people. It, it, you know, we're a, we're a little flick in the ocean, so um, I think we need to keep things concentrated at the top and sort it out from below. I'm not sure if you agree with it or not in that case, with the cups. Uh, I, I don't agree with it. Okay, Patrick, what's your thought? Oh, look, I, I think uh I'd need to see the direction it's going to go in and 
Um, I'm not sure that we're going to understand exactly what's going to happen until we, we actually see what's happening. Um, you may be doing it for perfectly valid reasons, I Well, all. they may be, but that's, you know, <laughs> one of those things we'll find out when we get there. Mm. Mm. Julie? I think it's tragic, really, and um, I might just say that I'm here representing uh, the past because I've been involved in the arts since 1970, so probably most of the audience weren't born then. <laughs> And I've seen funding come and go and courses come and go and I think the lack of continuity is ter terrible because we have students starting a course that are una unable to finish it at the moment to get a, a certificate or a degree or a diploma on the central coast is impossible. You have to go to Sydney or Newcastle. Well, and that's a topic we'll come to yeah. in, mo in more depth. Okay. But just on the Australia Council thing, mm -hmm. Fiona, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, they got the grants. Um, well, that they've cut their money, or that yeah. he's moved the money into his own um, idea of what, where it should go. I, I agree with Julie. I think that it's, it is quite tragic, and I think cutting funds in the arts full stop is, um, you know, I just feel like there's not enough culture in our society as it is, and, you know, anything with the arts is just not recognised as much. Um, sport's just such a big thing in my area, and uh, it's supported. Mm. a great deal so I just think it is quite tragic. Well the consensus yeah. seems to be that the Australia Council knows what they're doing you should have left it alone. <laughs> um, okay before we get into our major topic I've asked each of you as we do with everyone to bring a, a, a random item with you. Yeah. So Fiona what have you brought for us to have a look at? Okay well I've and to tell us a bit about away. yourself in the process. Okay well these are oh. actually I don't know whether people would actually know what these are but um, these were my they're quite old now and uh, ripped and, and torn. These are called point shoes. Um, to those who don't know anything about point shoes, these are the shoes that you dance on your toes. So um, basically they aren't made of wood as a lot of people think they are, but they actually have like a, a block, well they, we call it a block, but it's, it's actually made of just um, synthetic fabrics and, and uh, something stiff in there. And, uh, <laughs> These Blood are quite little. Your <laughs> yeah, well, yes, they, your toes have to leave them pointing. Point oh, yes, point, yes, yes, yes. So they're, um, they represent what I, what I do. Um, I, I train classical ballet dancers and many other genres as well. And uh, these were my first pair. <laughs> my very first pair. And I think I was probably around about uh, 11, 12 years old. You so that's the size. Uh, no, I, I tried to and, and my foot got about to the just mm. the beginning and that was that. So no, there's no way I can show it's you. It's a wonderful, so you've kept them, you still have them. I, yeah, well, you know, it's just, uh, I never get, got to keep my very first pair of ballet shoes when I was four. Mm. So I said to my mother, "This I'm keeping these. Right. Yeah, so they're very special Terrific. to me. Terrific, thank yes. you. Mm. Ian, what have you got to show us? Um, I have a, a, a grab bag, actually. I take this with me everywhere. Um, being an actor, you need to be ready for anything. So, Always you know, you're, you're often running to an audition or running to a show, so my motorcyclist's shower. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's the, uh, the motorcyclist's shower. What so, do you mean? So it's just a deodorant. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's motorcyclist's shower, uh, breath freshener. I think I need some of Yeah, I need yeah some okay, I'll hand them out later. And uh, I've got a little kit bag here, which has got a few unusual things in it. A few, um, few coins are in there, a few shekels for a coffee. You always want to have a coffee. Uh, a little torch for if you're lost somewhere in the dark after a show and you can't find your way around that back alley in Redfern properly. A <laughs> knife in case you get, um, although it's very it's small. It's a knife. very small If you need to peel an apple. <laughs> <laughs> um, to eat a, um, what else have I got here? I've got a. I think uh, you better there. stop there. No, I've, got a, I've got a gold ring just in case I need a, I lose a tooth and I can melt it down. Um, <laughs> I've got some matches there as well. And um, what's probably most unusual is a um, seam unpicker. <laughs> which is great for getting Most splinters out when you've been know, working on sets. I don't know if this kit means you've come totally prepared or totally unprepared. Um, <laughs> well, both. That's the irony, you see. You see, it's, um, that's the improvisational side of my acting. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Patrick, what have you got to show us? Um, I've bought my uh, baton. This well, this is, is the tool of the trade for you. This is yeah. the uh, weapon of choice of the conductor. <laughs> and uh, this is my magic wand, if you like, for turning students into musicians. You just hit them with it. <laughs> well, no, I try not to. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, look, it's a, it's a special thing and it, um, 
it's what allows me to create music and through gesture I uh, mm -hmm. draw the music out of the students. So what is the trick with the baton? It's not just waving it around, well, is we it? We should hold it the right way for starters, so we something like that. Right. And uh, look, we, I, th I think conductors are perceived as beat keepers, but that's not really our job. We, we show beat, but we also want to uh, show expression. So, you know, for example, you might be just playing a nice piece going like that, but if you wanted to show a beautiful piece, then we'd put some gesture into it as well. So, and that's what draws the students to mm. give the sound that we well, Is it fair to say that seeing a conductor perform with the orchestra is the final 1% of the job really. It's all the preparation the leading up to that performance. That's what we are supposed to say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the performance is the fun part. Absolutely. Actually, Julie, what have you got to show us? Oh, I've got a little uh, children's book that I'm just releasing. I don't need those notes, they can stay there. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's called Fabulous Aussie Fables and it's full of colour illustrations all the way through that I've done. You do the illustrations yourself? Oh yes, yeah? okay. so self-publishing is what I'm about and uh, I like to stay in control, you see. So, so this is my fifth book. Oh yeah. And uh, I would encourage anyone to just have a go. Forget, I would too, forget in fact. Forget the courses and everything else, <laughs> just learn it from Google and have a go because <laughs> it's so satisfying. It is, I've self-published a novel myself and it's actually becoming the way to do things these days. It's okay. more financially rewarding if you sell enough, you know, not going through a publisher. It's, it's quite right. easy to do actually, if you go through Amazon and all. But we actually have a show coming up later that talks, we'll talk about all of this, our literary okay. show. But I'm glad you brought that along. Yeah, thank you. Okay, training in arts and education, uh, in, in the arts. To me, there's two aspects to this, you know, um, training and education. There is education, which is teaching the kids. What they do in primary school and high school teaching them how to paint, how to play an instrument, um, how to be a better person through artistic endeavours. They may never become an artist, but it, it's developing their worth as a human being and their, their sense of culture. Then there is what I feel is training in the arts for those who want to be professional artists of some kind, professional musicians or whatever it might be, uh, where you go to a college, you go to the con, for example, to learn how to do it properly and be a professional in that area. Uh, we have people here representing sort of all facets of that. So Fiona, what kind of students do you tend to teach? Oh, we have a mixture actually. So when you talked about the education, um, I'm guessing more of like the recreational yeah. kind of dancer. Um, so I have taught in schools going back a long time. So I probably taught within schools, not as a school teacher, but just teaching dance as a sport choice. So in addition to sport, dance was an option. Mm -hmm for those who, like me, didn't like sport. Um, so that was, so I've had that experience um, whilst I ran my own school. So in my school, I have from two-year-olds right through to adults and total beginners at every age. And then we have um, more the, the children who are gonna or want to sort of take it on more seriously, whether they are going to be professionals at it or not. Mm. And then we've got, um, so you've got that sort of education meets, what was the next word you said, the um, sort of training, training. Yeah. And, and then we go into the vet courses. So you do have, you, you are running vet courses yes. in more advanced dance for those that want to make a career of it. Yes, right. so and then we've got a transition as well for the children who are juggling school and want to sort of do dance a little bit more seriously. So we do cater for, you know, the absolute okay. beginner right through so to- So you're teaching recreational dancers Yes. for whatever reason, and those that want to make it uh, once they hit their teen years and or whatever. And everywhere in between. Yes. So ha how do you balance that? How do you approach it differently for each of those types of, of students? Um, as in from a just a teaching perspective? Well, when they say, I would like to do this as a profession, yep. I want to get serious about this, yes. what do you do differently from that point on? Well, there's a lot of advising. So obviously, um, you know, you need to sort of really find out whether they just like the idea of it, or their friends do it, or they really have a passion for it. And then it's advising them, okay, well, you probably need to, to do a bit more training in this area. You might need to do a bit more hours. You might need to um, start focusing on, you know, certain aspects of the training. Um, and is that the point when you bring in, and we have the vet course? Uh, yeah, so it depends on the age. So, you know, I can have this conversation with a person who's in 
uh, like grade six or grade five at school, like primary school mm. age, and they're already starting to make those dreams. Whereas you've got a 15 year old who goes, oh, I think I'd, I'd like to become a professional dancer. And you're going, well, you better get moving. You know, mm -hmm. you are 15 and you know, um, so it really just depends on so many things because you've got finances, you've got school, um, you've got parents <laughs> 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 and uh, you've got different, you know, levels of all of that. So I guess it, it, you sort of advise them on what you think they need to do. And then of course it's decisions of the parents saying, well, they can't leave school yet. So then we've got the transition option or let's just keep going with school, but do these extra training after school hours on the weekends and then see where it goes from there. Well, I'll so ask this of everyone, but yep. it's like, at what point do you take, you know, they've got to be passionate. They've got to say, this is my, you know, if I just, I would like to do it. It's like, well, you're not serious enough, no. really. Yeah. Well, what do you think, um, Ian? Um, and well, how do they have, what's your approach at MADCAL with, with different kinds of students and they're, they're those that really want to be part of theatre, be actors? Yeah, we're, we're not as broad as Fiona is at her school. However, the, the onus is still, for those who want to move beyond recreational, it's to push them forward and to, to have that outlet for them. So that, for me, uh, starts in the process of who I hire and who's looking after the kids, first off. So all my teachers are jobbing actors, so we're, they're working professionals, and, and we all work together and have regular meetings on where we're going, where we're heading, what we're doing each term, how we want to um, fold over each term into the next term. And that is partially actually based on what kids bring to class, so what their skill sets are and what they're going through in their life. So we're guided by their needs rather than determining a strict curriculum to them. Mm. So because, of, because of its, its storytelling nature um, and, and their ability to gain confidence in themselves from telling their story, we, we can walk, walk in with a curriculum on any given day, but because Johnny or Sarah says, this happened today because they're in that environment where they trust everyone because it's a bit of a football team like that you know we, we always say to them what happens here stays here because you could have two kids from the one school that actually pick on each other in the same class they get to come there and work out their differences mm -hmm. and they actually end up supporting each other so, so do you so see most of what you're doing is that recreational that emotional support we're not talking about becoming an actor, but using theatre as a way to become a better it's, person. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely the, the tool and medium. And I see that with all arts first off, because it's, um, firstly, it's, it's a, a mental health support system. Mm. That's what I see it as. Mm. Then I see it as the more, the, the more finesse can come in and be drawn out. It's particularly, of, well, any of them, really. But for those who then need to want to hunker down and do the hard work, and it, I think it will be respective in, in all our schools and whoever we're teaching in whatever form of arts and whether it's sculpting or music or dance or writing that we will have these students that you just feel are ticking with it and opening up mm. and they're, they're willing to open up their heart and their soul mm. and, and, and they're willing to go the extra distance. So we start then mentoring those students, mm. getting them into groups to perform outside, do street theatre getting them to help us with the junior students, that's a big one, So because that's where I learnt my trade. I, I started as, as an amateur at Learned by teaching. 30 years <laughs> of age, I thought I like this, I, I do stupid things and people clap for me, <laughs> I'm going to do more of this, I like the, the idea of being a performing scene. Are you a clown? Do you have you so done clowning? So I'm an idiot. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, I, I went to Sydney and, and started taking up every single course I possibly could. Mm. Well, I, I should speak on behalf of, um, I, I represent film and digital media basically because I also teach film and digital media. Mm -hmm. And I've taught that at TAFE and at, at private colleges. And just to come to what you were saying, just so the audience understands, um, there is a structure, the VETS, the Vocational Education Training Packages, uh, that colleges will teach. And this is where you earn a certificate for diploma, advanced diploma in whatever the, the, the discipline is that you're doing. This is what I teach in screen and film production, what you're doing in dance. And it's also, Patrick, what you're doing with the, at the conservatorium, yes? So you're teaching these qualified qualification courses. That's right, we, we have VET courses at our conservatorium. Um, but I guess uh, the way I perceive it as a classical musician, and, and maybe that's different to, to others, is that those are launch pads. Those VET courses and also our higher um, courses we do, you know, for example, music, uh, Amy B courses, etc., that students do along the way. 
they're what propels the students and we are the launch pad for them moving off to tertiary education at the, um, in the big cities. That's mm. essentially what it is for classical music. You, you work in your regional conservatorium to the highest level, usually year 12, and that's when we say, off you go, now it's time to work at a different level. And then the tertiary institutions are a launch pad in themselves for you know, study overseas or for injection into uh, uh, professional orchestras or whatever music genre. So what we're talking about here is the, uh, the vet training, which is mm. like diploma level, mm. but then when you go to university, you go into degrees and there's BAs. That's and correct. Or, and yeah, so and Bachelor of Music, Master of Music, yeah. PhDs, all that sort of stuff. So you're so like a pre preparation school, preparatory yeah, school for that if they want to get really serious. I, th I yeah? think so. And look, the, the, way I, the way I approach teaching is that uh, every student I guess has something to offer and the ones that you perceive as having that special something, they sort of let you know in their own way and then you know to hone their skills so that they will be propelled in the direction in which they need to go. Um, Julie, uh, what's your experience as a teacher in art? And what oh kind of students goodness. do you tend to How teach? How long have you got? <laughs> 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 Look, I'll just cut forward to recent years where I've discovered computers and I now teach online because I have a bit of a hearing problem which makes face-to-face -face teaching difficult for me. So I'm still in touch and in fact more so with all over the world. You know, it's amazing. Just amazing. How do you teach art online then? Well, I use YouTubes and um, they send me their work and then I do critiques and mm. If I need to demonstrate, I'll use the YouTube to send back to them and that type of thing. But um, other than that, I've got a lot of free art lessons online. Just artintegrity.wordpress.com. <laughs> There's my little thing. <laughs> and it's all free. For those people who can't get to courses or can't afford to get to courses, uh, I have empathy with them because when you're raising young children, for instance, and you're passionate about what you want to do with your life, what's available. So I've put it all out there, which I can do at this stage of my life. I can do all the love jobs. So you're kind of catching the ones that fall through the cracks that aren't getting to school. Um, I can't afford a, a, a more expensive course, yeah. that kind of thing. I, I help groups overseas too, homeschool groups, and that type of thing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, this is actually a big topic, um, online training online universities, that kind of thing. And a lot of the TAFEs in colleges like this are, are doing part of their courses online. Does that work in the arts? It can work for writing. I've done it with writing, but can it work for, for dance and for theatre? Fiona? People, well, people are doing it to, for dance. I guess more like tutorials, mm. as in not tutorials to speak to them. Well, they are, but to break down something, you know, how to do a pirouette which is a turn, you know, how to really work on the mechanism. So watch someone so, doing an expert Yeah, so pirouette. somebody's like talking and, you know, so I guess there is online training as such. Um, but you don't have someone watching to make sure you do it right. No. Coaching That's you That's right. That. So, you know, you sort of think, try to sort of imagine online dance classes. To me, it would be like the aerobics class, you know, like somebody just standing there and you just follow them. But yes, there wouldn't be any instruction other than, I hope you're stretching your feet and I hope you're stretching your <laughs> leg in the leg. You know, so look, maybe, you know, maybe there is scope for it, you know? Ian, any, any chance of, have you seen theatre online at all? Any, that kind of thing? Uh, look, I, I know there's the live streaming of, um, of plays. Quite often, I find unless, uh, unless a f a f you have a creation of film, and it's manipulated and controlled. Replay of of, of theatre or live performances looks pretty naff. So uh, it's also for me personally, I, I would not be into it at, at all because of the lack of soul. It's because it's all about the human connection mm. with the way we teach through Mad Cow. Um, and I'm understanding. I, I'm getting a mm. sense of feeling from Fiona of that too. She can mm. understand and you can have the componentry broken down, but we're just starting to get a little bit automated now. You know, if I, if I was a student and I was playing a bass, bassoon, I'd be mm. wanting this beautiful man standing <laughs> out in front of me with mm. his baton 
drawing <laughs> feeling out of me. Performing <laughs> art, um, yeah, I, I find I, I it just difficult. Walk away from the screen, I'll be. <laughs> yeah. How do you? But music, you can kind of learn online. There yeah. are certainly guitar well, tutorials and things like that. First of all, I don't, I don't teach the bassoon with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the larger groups. Um, Told you I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so good, um, but um, I think the. Um, Look, well, look, we actually, we're very lucky in the Regional Conservatorium Network. There's 18 New South Wales Regional Conservatoriums and we have uh, some equipment, equipment that's been uh, provided by the Par Department of Education and that allows us to see one monitor, which is yourself, and the other monitor, which is a teacher or someone else in another location. And there are a number of conservatoriums that don't have the capacity, they don't have a bassoon teacher. So they dial in to a conservatorium who has that teacher and then they can still engage with that student um, on a one-to-one -one lesson. And it's live though. Live, yes. live. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not perfect live. Uh, one thing that uh, some of the um, big organisations like Opera and Ballet Orchestra, uh, um, the Australian Opera, what they've done is they've done some programs with the Conservatorium Association where they uh, have linked up with students and, you know, so I guess mentored and take them through certain aspects of musical scores, teaching them how to play it. But we still don't really have the technology at the moment where it's, uh, where you can collaborate perfectly together. And um, I know they're working on that. Because of latency and just... Well, really that's right, just, just yeah. delay. It's, yeah. it's, it's quite difficult. I guess the other aspect uh, of it is that, um, from my point of view personally, uh, working with a student in, I guess, close proximity, there's things that the body says that you see, that you pick up, that I think is probably lost through that technology. So mm -hmm. I, I think the the one-to-one -one, uh, tuition musically uh, and also in, in group tuition is, uh, I, I think it's critical for really um, picking up on those fine details. Well, I've got to say, even, even with film, which I teach, it's a bit similar. I mean, you can. There are certain things you can get from a tutorial online. There, there are lots of excellent tutorials. But to teach the craft of filmmaking, to teach how to direct a scene, how to use a camera properly, um, how to mm. you know all of the aspects of it, the technical aspects. Mm. The best way to do it is to get out there and physically do it with mm. the students. And I would be <coughs> supervising a shoot with students, for example, mm. Mm. Uh, rather than doing it in a classroom. Most of the time I try to get out there and we just go out and shoot something and that's how you learn by doing it. Mm -hmm. the tr but the next topic I want to bring up is that uh, in my area in particular, there's been some major budget cuts with TAFE and arts departments are the ones that tend to get slashed first. And at the TAFE where I used to teach, uh, they lost a lot of the, the funding that they get, therefore they have to start charging commercial fees. And most of the students that we would get now can no longer afford that course, mm. you know, the, the more disadvantaged students. Mm -hmm. And they can't do the discipline that they would like to do because it's costing eight, ten, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars a semester, basically. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. for a, that's commercial rates. Yeah. Um, yet private colleges who are teaching similar digital media, which is where I'm about to start teaching, in fact, charge the same rate, but they teach it in a very different way. It's an attractive way. It's, it works around the students' um, lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, works around their time. So as long as they can afford it, mm -hmm. it's uh, more attractive to them. How do you feel in your various disciplines? about is there enough funding in the arts, is the right kind of funding? You know, are we getting the right kinds of students? I'll start with you again, yeah. Fiona. I wish I had funding. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, running a private school, so I yes. I'm running a private school, uh, but I spoke to um, Patrick earlier about his setup is, is totally different to mine and kind of envious about that <laughs> in many ways because the funding side of it. Um, however, we're not an RTO, oh sorry, we're not an RTO ourselves. Um, we go under a dance organisation. RTO for the Registered, registered Training sorry, Organisation, registered. so those that can receive the, yes, the qualifications. Sorry, registered yes. training organisation. So we don't have the power to sort of go, right, well, let's go and organise funding. So it's, it's our RTO that needs to sort of do that, which they're in that process of because I sort of pushed it several years ago and sort of said, are you going to do that? Uh, possibly. I said, mm. well, I need it, and so does probably everybody else that's going under you. And it's sort of you know, it, I, can't, I think it's necessary because the, it's a lot of money and people, it always comes down to the money. So what I offer in my s studio is um, it's private, it's a private studio. So they have to fork out that $200 a week, mm. you know, and that's, and then there's 
costumes and shoes, point shoes, where do they go? Yeah. These things cost a hundred dollars plus. And you Sometimes go through them. And they go through them. Yeah. Some dancers go through them every two weeks. Mm. Oh. So just to give you an idea of the cost. So it's an expensive hobby come profession. Yes, yes. For, for little return in many ways. Um, so I just, funding would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but you're also the help is coming. You're also it running a coming. private school, you're not an RTO. So you're running, running it yourself. Yes, that's right. Student paid mm. fees. Yeah. And I actually, there was a stage a little while back, five years ago, I, I, well, 15 years ago, I set up a complete theatre by myself. Mm. And um, I figure I, I've probably put about, probably close to half a million. Um, I work full time as well and have done all my life to support my addiction for the arts. Mm. And um, it's, uh, look, I, I, I think it's, it's good that there is a, a broad spectrum of, of balance, of people like Fiona and myself coming in with, with our backgrounds and the way we work our system and the systems that, um, that Patrick works in. And um, because it gives you a broad depth of experience, it gives you a different style of experience, and we're talking about the arts, so as many styles of experience or opinions or expressions we can get, mm. Um, okay, so before we finish up here, I'd like to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Peter Healy is in the audience and you have a question for us, Pete? We do. I have Alex with me. He's going to stretch our panel somewhat, we think. Alex, what's your question? All right, so I go to Sydney every day to the Australian Institute of Music. Um, I play in a few bands. Uh, you know, my, my, my problem is that there's not really any venues or infrastructure on the Central Coast. Like, sure, there's tuition, you've got the conservatorium, but what are you doing to make more venues to create these places for people to play at? The lots just closed down. Yep. You've really got nothing around. We had this discussion um, last month, in fact, a bit about venues, that there are plenty of little venues if you're a cover band, yeah. not many venues if you're an original artist, you know, playing original music. Mm. Um, you're the music guy, what do you think? Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, look, from a, and look, we're, we're Slightly different world. You're a different genre to, to me personally, but I, I guess we 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 uh, all look for appropriate spaces and venues. And look, the Central Coast is lacking. I I think there's no two ways about it. What are we doing about it? Well, the Conservatorium uh, and FOPUP, Friends of the Performing Arts Precinct, we're working very hard to gain a, a concert space uh, uh, on the waterfront or somewhere around that area, anywhere in Gosford. We need. We need those spaces um, to perform, and we need the right sort of spaces as well. What kind of music do you play, Alex? Well, I play all sorts. Like I'm currently in a little jazz two-piece thing. Uh, I play in a metal band, and then I also perform with Novocaine, which is probably my main thing right, right now. I, th I think uh, losing Lazotz, I think that's a real shame, because yeah. that was a, a great venue for, for us to see contemporary music. At, uh, and the conservatorium actually utilised that venue, uh, you know, at least a few times a year uh, for our contemporary program. And yeah, we're grappling. Where do where do we put our students? We like to put our students into professional venues, and it's a, it's a difficult one. Let me expand that to theatre. Do you think um, there's enough theatre place? We have Laycock Street. You know, there isn't really a professional theatre scene on the coast at all. Theatre or dance? It's we don't we don't have enough. Um, totally agree with Patrick there. Uh, our infrastructure lacks, um, it lacks vision, it's lacked vision for four or five decades. I was born in Gosford, I'm 53 this year, and it really has not been progressive. I've had the, the joy of, of travelling all around Australia and seeing um, council areas, LGA, smaller than this, with better civic infrastructure. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Um, they have civic centres, they town have halls. a great theatre <laughs> town, <yeah. laughs> town halls, they have a great theatre attached, they not yeah. only have a theatre attached, they'll have a music space attached, they'll have uh, stores and cafes attached, they will have outside performance spaces mm. attached that anyone could, could jump in and utilise. Well this is whether part of what Wyong's trying to do with the new arts centre, it's what Gosford's hoping to do to redevelop the region. Mm. Um, is there enough supporting councils to, to do this with the arts and culture? I, I, think the, I think the council's definitely behind, well, the Performing Arts Precinct, I, I truly believe that. I think the, the important thing is actually getting a groundswell 
from the community. The community demanding the it. community needs to say we want this culture, the arts is important to us and we want to see this flourish. We want to see the rejuvenation of Gosford. We want to see the Central Coast flourish in that way. And 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 I think until we're limited in what we can deliver and how we can deliver it, I take si kids to Sydney to perform because I want to wow them. They need that experience. They need to land on those big concert platforms and go, wow, mm. and have those feelings that we were talking about before. And unless you've got the right space, it doesn't happen. We had this discussion last month, you know, if, they, if we do build these spaces, will, you know, they're big spaces, professional spaces, is there enough content to fill them and, and make them profitable? If we, if, we do, if we design it well, and if we communicate with the local groups, whether they be music, dance, uh, drama, um, and even art. There's even no art reason galleries, why yeah. there's no We've reason got one why art gallery, there's no one key art gallery. No reason the why yeah. somewhere like the Performing Arts Precinct can't be a beautiful gallery at the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a matter of design, it's a matter about uh, dialogue with the, uh, I guess, relevant stakeholders and making sure that we end up with the spaces that so we need. There you are, Alex. You basically get up, kick up a stink, say we need more venues for uh, live original music. Yep on the coast generally. Pete, we got another question? Uh, I should just mention at this point too, and it's just, I've just been reminded of it, that uh, the very venue where we now sit, or in my case stand, <laughs> um, the, the Rhythm Hut has international touring acts playing here. They have open mics and they also have um, uh, acts in general, original acts in general. So they're doing something for the region. This is one of those rare places on the coast, yes. We hope too that the, well the grammar school's just opened, and we mentioned this last week, the grammar school's just opened a new, whole new performance space, and we're hoping that the, the new Central Coast, um, what are they calling it, the, the performance centre that they've, I think, approved, haven't they, the, the regional performance Well, they, they've been promised the money by the federal government, so we'll ah, see if it happens. There, yes, but well, Wyong are building there's already their arts centre, that's happening. Yeah. yeah, so there are some things happening, but on the, I agree with Alex, on the ground, it's a little thin if you're an original artist. Kaz has a question for us. Yeah, well, they're cutting the funding to the arts. They're now adding taxes to iTunes. And the venues, the original artists, are being squeezed out by cover bands. My concern is the young up-and-coming ones are going to have no incentive if they can't play anywhere, if they can't make any money. Mm -hmm. People are downloading the music for free and they're finding it very, very difficult to make a living. We've got to do something to give them incentive because what's going to happen if, you know, they just can't do it in the future? They're going to be saying, well, what's hmm. the point? Okay, I'll play in my bedroom. Well, we're going to, we'll cover this topic in some detail next month, which is our music episode. Mm. But just to answer your question, my son, as I mentioned, is a musician. He has faced this himself working in America uh, they don't make money from iTunes sales or CD sales. No one buys CDs anymore. They make it yeah. from merchandise and touring. Yeah. That's where the money is for performing artists. Performance is back. If you're a live performing act, you can make money, as a, which you guys do, yeah. as a performing act. The CD and iTunes has become the marketing for the performance, for the gig. It's not the other way around like it used to yeah. be. And you sell the t-shirts, you sell the hats, you sell whatever merchandise you can. Make your money that way. But y you're right, it's hard. And the same is true in film these days, you know, for, for my particular industry. People download movies, download TV. How can we guarantee a sale that's going to make your money back? And th why bother doing it if you can't make a living at it? Yeah, exactly. You know? And you can see, you can see there's going to come a day where the parents of these kids are going to say, don't be doing that, you can't make a living. You know, like they did when we were, mm. you know, way back. And it, it's, it's getting to the point now where parents are trying to discourage the kids mm. from getting into it because there doesn't seem to be a bright future. But I think the kids won't be discouraged if they're serious. Yeah. To, to quote Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Yeah. You know, somehow... It'll weed them out. We just have to find the new <laughs> business model that works for everyone. Yeah. And we're still struggling to find that even... And we need to do it fast. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting that you say life will find a way and you also add duly weed them out <laughs> because I think I, I believe the arts really is like nature and and as multi uh, consumerism grows um, nature is downtrodden nature will always fight back when it when something collapses there's always the weeds are growing back through the flowers are growing mm -hmm. back through 
arts will always bubble through. It will always mm. bubble through. It has to because it's people's expression. It's it's who it's who we are. Mm. As as quintessential, way back there, just out of the caves, mm. pieces of expression. It's it's how we. It kind of comes down to there, there seems to be a lack of respect for arts and artists these days, yeah. both from the government and the funding bodies and the you know the authorities and the peop the audience. Mm. Don't, because they can get it for free, they think, okay, well, it's not illegal necessarily, or it's easy. They don't see the implications of it. I, can I put yes, yes, up? Fiona. I, I really think that it comes back to the education in the schools, because they are our future audience. And if we're not doing it in the schools, what have we got for the future? Well, who are we creating as our audience? Mm -hmm. We need those, just general public, we need people to appreciate it and respect it mm -hmm. to be able to go, well, I'm not the performing artist, but I want to go and see art. I want to go and yes. see dance. I want to go into the art gallery. I want to go and see that drama production. Teach people art. They can earn a respect for it. And, and then go and watch. And they, then they're the audience. Mm -hmm. Then we provide, you know, an audience to go and yeah. see it at least. Because I think it's coming right back from in the school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. I'm just going to go quickly around the panel. Uh, if you have anything to spruik your website or your latest work. So Julie, what have you got to, to, oh, to sell? Well, just my website. If you just type in free art lessons, Julie Duell, you'll find it all. <laughs> okay. Okay. Patrick. Central Coast Conservatorium, uh, www.centralcoastconservatorium.com.au. Um, our vision, our tagline is inspiring artistry and that's what we want all our students to do, be inspired and love what they're doing. Okay, yeah. Madcowtheatre.net, uh, like us on Facebook, the Mad Cow Theatre Company. Uh, we just love what we do. It's mm. growing and where our most important asset. Where are you located? We're, uh, I work out of a home office now at, at my place at Avoca Beach, but we have seven venues around the Central Coast. Right, so they're all over yes. the place. Boom, 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 yeah. So we try to be, keep local for people, yeah. And so check out the website and find out what's closest to you. Yeah, yeah. give us a call and we'd love to chat. Fiona. Mm. Uh, um, <laughs> studio of Dance, www.fsdance.com.au. And my slogan is, um, Enhancing lives through the magic and power of dance. So I just really believe that's what we, we live for and stand for. And we're at Morissette. So okay. we're just on the top end of the Central Coast. Yeah. Um, we have our local legend package we're going to show you now. This is a local artist who, who works with fan materials. Um, Sandy James. Let's have a look at that now. Hello and welcome to this special interview. We have artist and art teacher Sandy James. Thank you for having us in your studio today. Well, thank you for coming. Where did it all start? Well, I think it started with me choosing to do art. I chose to do art, but I was directed in the wrong way. And it's not till uh, probably five years ago when I opened Pablo's Art House that I feel really settled in where I needed to be with my art. So I feel really blessed. Yeah. But the journey's been fantastic. Uh, Neil Berrickry Brown was also another lecturer of mine, and he was um, creating EO. I'd have to look at what it was called again, but it was it was uh, looking for a grant, and he was um, it was to go to Nine Dragons Dragon Heads Symposium in South Korea, mm. and um, and uh, Meredith Copland. Um, Meredith, Meredith Bryce Copland and Maul McKajic uh, and myself were chosen as the emerging artists to go across and it was so exciting. Um, and then when we were there we met Mr Park who, who I just fell in love with immediately and, uh, and all the international artists and we were the three emerging artists from Australia. I'm sure Neil was very nervous because what we had to do we went to Daejeong Lake and that was south of Korea in this mad drive. Um, they all drive mad mm. over there. Um, when we were there, we had to walk around as this group of people from everywhere. And then there was this lake. So we walked around this lake and what we had to do was find a site specific, or a site that we would do something. And um, I was drawn to the reeds that were just there. And I, I've seen the old ladies, you know, those ones that can't actually the, stand up yeah. anymore. Yeah. 
and they were out there doing so I thought I know what I'm going to do I did, it just came to me and I went out there and I thought I'm going to make a jacket so I started weaving these reeds I literally pulled them didn't take them out of the ground just pulled them like a loom and wove them you know and whilst I was out in this field and everyone's in their own spot Meredith chose another spot Mama was another spot um, all very conceptual I remembered my grandmother used to weave and she had looms mm. and I, it hadn't even come to my mind you know until I was there mm. and it was like she showed me how to do it and it's, it might sound strange but I was in another world and I worked really really hard on this jacket and I made it and it's actually on the Nine Dragon Heads webs, um, website so oh, wow. I'm thrilled because it must have meant something to Mr Park. So um, I wanted to ask you it's the 10 year anniversary for the Five Lands Walk this year and you've been a part of the Five Lands Walk. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. That, How you got uh, involved? Uh, well, I got involved right from the beginning. Mm. Um, uh, Lynn Bassey from the cafe, the, the, the cafe, the kiosk, sorry, Lynn, down at Avoca Surf Club, uh, said to me, you should come along and listen to this meeting. Con Ryan was um, the, representing the, the Surf Life Saving Club and the Lizards, which I've also done in uh, a work, Lizards. Um, and there was Gabby Duncan, and there was this really enthusiastic Italian, Elio Gabby. But then I, I heard Elio, and I heard um, Gabby, and I thought, oh my goodness, I've only recently come back from South Korea. That's why I went. Mm. I'm supposed to be showing people how to do art on the beach. I mean, like, da, 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 da. <laughs> it's not all about me, but I just, and, and you know, there was, there was a spokesperson who was sort of saying, we're going to have, um, you know, marquees and we'll set up showing what art we do as individuals and I'm going like, no, it's not about us as individuals, it's about us coming together, mm. you know. I could see it, it was just dropped in my lap, right. so I took it up. I put it to the organisers that this, mm. is, this is what I did. We could, um, you know, do ephemeral art, uh, ephemeral art, that's what it's called, site specific, um, using what's there um, making something out of it to express um, you know the place to mm. express the place are you proud of what you've achieved you know I, I am I looked back to find information which I haven't used at all today yeah and for you yeah and I am I am actually astonished at what's happened mm. I didn't realize how the journey connected so much mm. in hindsight yeah <laughs> So um, you've had a career of over thirty uh, years. I have. Is, yeah, I have. And you know, and I, 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 the first time I was put money in my hand, I thought it was wrong. Right. But it's not wrong. Don't ever sell yourself short. That's right. You know. So, what's your biggest achievement? Um, I think just standing up and saying, "I'm going to, I'm going to make Pavlo's art house," mm. and I'm going to stand on my own two feet. Right. You know, I'm not going to cling to anyone anymore. It's time to yeah. own something. Ownership. Yeah. yeah. This is who I am. Okay, welcome back everyone. Welcome back to the litmus test. We are going to close the show today with another song from Novocaine, but first I would like to thank today's artwork supplied by Nicole Demestra, a local artist who uses recycled materials to create a range of eclectic works. All those things you saw in our podcast stage in the background came from Nicole. Uh, you can contact her on her Facebook page, Nicole Demestra Artist, or via her website, NicoleDemestra.com, and you'll see it in the lower third right now if you're watching the, the downloaded version. Thank you, Nicole, for letting, letting us see your artworks as part of our show. That is the litmus test for this episode. Thank you all for watching. You can find us at thelitmustest.com or look us up on Facebook. Uh, you'll find other clips on our website that are not part of this regular episode, like the full version of our Local Legends interview and more stuff besides, so what didn't make it into the show. So, but let's wrap it up with another song from Novocaine. Thanks, Novocaine. Thank you, everybody. So we thought, considering tonight's um, material, our subject, we thought we'd... Uh, finish off with this song about the people who control the money. Sound... Oh, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> it's called Jamaica. Mm. 
trophy wife you've got the best of friends that all your cash can buy the outside world can't reach you cause your pedestal's so high that's what you think Life up, bitch. Your youngest daughter left the nest while way too young. Now she stars in pornos just to pay for all those drugs. Wise beyond her 16 years, she plays you for the fool. You still write all the checks, put that bitch through school. And you feel so lonely, but you're not the That is. Take her to Jamaica. Swamp pools and movie stars. Won't you like the wind to fill your sails? Don't lie, Jamaica. Jamaica. 